Yes. Just the right combination for my brew. Oh, hello. What are you doing here? I'm the law master and this is my lair. Ah, you seek law, do you? I see. What kind of law? The law of the forests, of the land, law of the elves, uh, the law of magic and the arcane? No, no, I know what you seek. You seek battle law, do you not? What? Show, show me your, your, your ticket. Maritime law. No, no, this is law. No, there's there's been a there's been a typo. This is I'm law. You want uh, down the corridor 45B. I can I can do I can do tort law. Battle law. <clears throat> battle law. Battle battle or battle law is a beautiful game of fantasy miniatures combat using wonderfully detailed playing pieces set across hex grids and using a system of hidden orders to allow two players to come together and fight for the future of a fantasy land. It's not, it's not just Memoir 44 with, with, it's not, it's not just that with monsters and elves. Hang on. I'm, I'm in a cupboard. Come on, you'd better look at the game prop. Actually crouching to do this shot. This, yes, this is battle or grand fantasy battles fought in, in cardboard and plastic and in miniature. Not a sprawling miniatures game, but something tiny enough to fit on your tabletop and yet epic enough to be, to be glorious and deadly and tragic and sad and noble and everything that fantasy combat should be. And exactly as you would expect from a game of fantasy battle, it's a, it's a game of cavalry charging archers, fighting men at arms and strange weird beasts and, and massive magical creatures, people throwing magical spells and wielding magical weapons. And you can probably tell I'm already getting a little bit excited. This certainly on paper looks like exactly the kind of game that someone made for the 12 year old version of me, which I still am. And although it's a game of great and terrible battles with enormous armies clashing on the battlefield, the rules are simple enough that you could finish a game in an hour or two and have a bunch of fights in an afternoon. But whoa, 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 back up there, hippogriff. It's not a, just not a, not a hippogriff. I don't know what that is. What am I talking about when I say this is a fantasy version of Memoir 44? That's going to make sense to, to some of you if you happen to have played the World War II hex-based cards for orders miniatures game that is Memoir 44. But if you haven't, I've just immediately alienated you. So first, we need to do a little bit of board gaming history. Way, way back in the... Yes, I'm in, I'm in the cupboard again, yes. Way, way back in the mists of time in the year 2000, long before you or I were born, a legendary game designer known as Richard Ball came up with the command and color system, a system that's been used several times since, always with the same intention, and that is to simulate the uncertainty of combat, the confusion of the battlefield, the fact that orders don't always get through, generals are not always in contact with their commanders. It's a very simple system, and it works like this. The commanders on each side are dealt cards that are the orders they could choose to play. And they'll hold a hand of these cards and every turn choose one of them, issue that, and then replace that by drawing another card. The battlefield is divided into three sections, two flanks and a centre, and the cards usually refer to orders that cover one part of the battlefield, or sometimes a certain kind of unit, or sometimes a special power. But the idea is on your turn, you can do one particular thing, usually in one or two places. And so you have to consider decisions like, if I only have one order card for the left flank right now, do I play that and use it? Or do I hold that in reserve because I may, I may not get another for a while? Such are the decisions, the conundrums, the troubles that come to a general in any of the Commanding Colors games. 
It's alright, I crawled out there in the end. Uh, where was I? Memoir 44, which is one of the games that we looked at in our first ever episode three years ago now, long before you or I were born, was one of the games that uses the Command & Colors system. We described it as being a bit like fencing. Although you have an entire army arrayed in front of you and lots of units to consider, lots of, of troops that you could move back and forth, really, the order cards, I wouldn't say make things easier, but perhaps make things a little simpler for you. They focus you, they give you one particular key choice every turn. Do you respond on the same flank that your opponent just moved on? Perhaps you make an advancement here, perhaps you consolidate your position. That's your thing that you'll do this turn, then you'll switch it back to your opponent. It keeps the game pacey, it keeps it precise, it keeps you thinking. It is like fencing. I've never fenced. And okay, while I've never fenced, I certainly have led many, many armies to victory in games of Memoir 44, and I recognise all those elements again here in Battle or that key system, that Command and Colour system, but also lots of awesome miniatures and lots of hexes, and lots of hex templates that you lay down. You see, the board initially is a blank canvas, and according to scenario setups, you're going to be putting down all kinds of different things on top of that board to build a new battlefield every time you fight. Now, building the map and putting all your terrain down in Memoir 44 was actually kind of cool. You had a whole bunch of scenarios defined for you in the rulebook that told you where you should put the terrain down, how you should compose your armies and what you're fighting for. And then you could buy a whole bunch of extra campaign stuff, more and more campaigns set on more and more fronts of the war that gave you new terrain and new scenarios to fight your way through. It's awesome. Battle Lord doesn't do that. Battle Lord does something completely different, which is also very cool. Both players will have decks of scenario cards. They'll shuffle them, they'll draw three, they'll look at what they have, pick one, and that will determine how their side of the board will look and what their objectives are going to be. And then they muster armies. And while Memoir 44 generally told you what units you had and where they, where they were going to start, where you had to put them, Battle Law says, what do you want? Do you want a bunch of archers and a giant flying bird? Sure, here's a certain amount of points to spend. Spend them, build the army you want. You're the general. So yes, it's immediately much more of a game about control, about giving you control and personalization from the start of the game. A sense of the army that you're gonna build and a sense of the things that you're gonna aim for. Of course, what you won't know is what your opponent's going to do. And when you start deploying, you won't even know where your opponent is going to be. And here's another cool thing about Battle Law. These coloured areas on all the scenario cards tell you where you can deploy your troops, but you can deploy them anywhere in these areas, and until deployment has finished, you and your opponent won't know exactly what is going to be where. There's a system of secrets at work. These guys are my rune golems. They're, they're pretty hard. I mean, they're, they're, they're literally quite hard. And I want to deploy them somewhere on the battlefield and say that uh, I can deploy here, here, here and here and a bunch of other spaces according to the, uh, the brief I've been given. Then I'll put down the cards that represent all my units, but I'll put them face down. And I'll have enough cards to fill all the coloured spaces. And then when both sides are finished, I'll flip those cards to reveal what they really are. And, ah, that one's a decoy. Ah, that one's a decoy. This one. Uh, just, uh, that, mm, yeah. No, still having, hold on. Right. This one's a decoy. This one's, ah, my, my, my rune golems are nowhere to be seen. Maybe you've deployed your entire army to, to try and counter what I might do on this flank and there's no troops here. There's no troops here. So you'll begin a game by choosing the scenario that you want to play and laying out the terrain and then picking the army that you want to pick, the buddies that you want to go into battle with according to how many points they cost, of course, but that's, that's very straightforward. And, you know, you'll assemble those troops and they'll be your, fr yeah, your buddies, your friends, your, oh, your, uh. You'll have those, but you may also keep just a few points aside to spend on lore. 
Law. Yeah, law is a kind of a, a magical energy, a, an otherworldly resource, a lot like the magic that you'll probably have in your own home. Now, of course, it's inevitable that all the units that you painstakingly recruited and deployed will meet on the field of battle and start hitting each other. That's just going to start happening in a turn or two. And when that does happen, you'll start rolling these lovely purple custom dice and scrying, pouring over those dice to determine the result of every fight. Depending upon what you roll, units will be injured or they'll retreat or their special abilities will trigger or more law will appear. It seems that magic is just a side effect of fighting. Just everything makes, just, ma just magic happens all the time. God, I wish it was really like that. Other things that can happen on the field of battle that aren't law appearing, that's what that symbol means, can be units being damaged by melee attacks, but that doesn't count if you're firing with arrows. Units being damaged by arrows, but that symbol doesn't count if you're in a melee attack or units being damaged in a melee attack if they've been hit by a particularly strong unit, but otherwise not. Or units running away because fl fl flags upside down, but you know, they're, they're going, ah, because stuff's happening and they don't like it because you've attacked them. Or, I can't find, there it is, special abilities. I should, you know what, I should probably talk about unit stats, very briefly, unit stats. The blue number on every card is how far the unit can move. These archers can move two hexes because they're not really fast or slow. And the red number is how many dice they roll when they attack. But remember, as archers, to actually do damage, they need to roll that symbol. None of the swords will count. The green number is how much damage they can take before they inevitably collapse under, you know, the weight of their injuries and or ennui. And there's usually some kind of special ability that the unit has which may trigger if you happen to roll, it's kind of menacing. Is that a helmet or a crown or a crown helmet? Anyway, you do that with a Chaos Lord, you're going to terrify an enemy unit. They're going to retreat not once, but twice. Now, I'll get to the lore cards in a moment, those extra special bits of magic, and I want to get to the lore cards in a moment, but I should just point out that, that all of that is kind of the meat and potatoes of battle lore. Everything I've described is... is it? It won't be long before you... You've got to grips with the order system of ordering troops on different flanks. You'll understand how that works. It won't be long before you understand how the dice rolling works. You only have six different symbols to learn and you'll quickly learn what all the special abilities of your units are. And then you kind of know the game and you can just get on with hitting people. And it also won't be long before you've seen your men fall on the field of battle and before you've drawn blood yourself and before you've killed. Now the battle that you have going on on your tabletop, the battle out for everyone to see, that's the honest fight. That's opponents looking one another in the eye as they strike and they parry, the soldiers falling and watching their friends fall and the, the screams and the blood and the sweat and the cries of pain of war. But when you introduce the law, that's when things get subversive. So remember I said how it's important to consider keeping law points at the start of the game, at the start of the game when you, you build an army and you're spending points to buy cavalry or archers or whatever. It's a good idea to keep some law points. And it's a good idea to remember that whenever you roll dice, you may generate a few more law points for yourself. That's, that's good, that's useful. And at the end of your turn, every turn, you may also either take two law points or one law point and one law card or two cards and then pick the one that you want to keep. That's all good, that's all, that's all great and incredibly useful because all of these cards have special powers. They do something quite distinct, quite discreet. That discreet thing could be earning you more victory points when you perform a particular action or it could be an extra move or it could be a slightly more dangerous attack. And these all have a cost and you burn that amount of law points to play that card. And that could be something that turns a fight around. It could be something that turns the battle around and your opponent has no idea when it's coming. No idea. It certainly adds a layer of unpredictability to events, particularly when your opponents start pulling out cards with names like Enchanted Arrows suddenly mean that your units are now in range of their archers even though you're halfway across the board and their archers have become even more deadly. 
In time, you'll get to know the cards, you'll learn them better and better, and they'll become a little less of a surprise, but you'll never know what's coming next. And I suppose that's the point. So the day is done, and evening draws in, or it, it will soon, and you've counted your dead, and you've counted your victory points. And I should point out, by the way, you don't actually score victory points by eliminating enemy units. This uh, doesn't work the same way as memoir. You score victory points by doing the things that the game has told you to do when you've set up holding objectives or fulfilling certain tasks. Although I should actually also point out you will win if you completely eliminate the other side, but you'd probably win in anything if you completely eliminated the other side, like even a game of football if all the other players on the other team were dead. Hmm. No, the, the question at the end of the day is have you had fun playing Battle Law? Have you enjoyed that? Of course you've enjoyed it, because Battle Law is easy to pick up and it's got a wonderful fantasy theme, and there really isn't too much to learn, sort of, stat-wise and unit-wise. Yeah, it'll take you a few moments, maybe, to memorise the abilities of the different units, but you'll learn as you play, and the lore cards will surprise you a bit too much at the start of the game, but you'll get used to the kind of stuff that comes up, and after two or three fights, you'll know where you stand. So, here's the thing, okay? Does Shut Up and Sit Down recommend Battle Law? Because Memoir 44. Just because... because Memoir 44. It exists, right? It's enormous. We love it. It's endlessly expandable. There's already much more of it, and this is just... Is this just Memoir 44 with monsters? It, it, it is, and with some cosmetic rule differences. So, surely... We just rem recommend the bigger game with the more... So Shut Up and Sit Down can't recommend Battle Law. And... No, look, wait, hang on. I'm, I'm clearly conflicted about this. I have... The, the day pretty much is done, all right? It is evening, it is time to count the dead and tally the living or whatever. Let's have a proper fireside chat about this because I feel there's something a, a bit more that needs to be said here. You know what? It's rained all day. It's supposed to be summer, it's been grey and it's actually freezing right now. Bridge is broken. I can barely afford the rent because it's too much and I've been lecturing and filming and writing and editing. No one can tell me that, that I won't have some fun getting a guy on a hex board with a spear to stab a hell monster. That sounds brilliant escapism after everything else that's happened. It's actually midnight. This is my fourth take of this attempt, and I've, I've actually not come up with any lyrics for a song yet. To do with monsters doing anything to other monsters. Which is pretty creatively bankrupt, if you think about it. You know, I'm using a borrowed folk tune that I don't even have to think about. I could do with another game of Battle Law. I could do with that escapism and that enjoyment. And if that's what works for you, if Memoir 44 with Monsters does your thing, I'm right with you and I'll be right there. I am freezing. <laughs> See you inside.